Dearest Guruji, my friend and I will ask the first question together. Well, that's nice. <laughs> first, do you do everything together? <laughs> yes. Ah, <laughs> oh, lovely. First, what is the right attitude for approaching spiritual unfoldment? And secondly, well, excuse me just a minute. And why is this right attitude important? More specifically, Guruji, why is an aid to spiritual enfoldment? Is it considered to be of value to abstain from smoking, <coughs> drinking alcohol, and eating meat? <laughs> Good. <laughs> Why is it necessary to have the right attitude for spiritual unfoldment? Now, if you do not have the right attitude, then you will not have spiritual unfoldment. So the gist of the question would be, why should we have spiritual unfoldment? Fine. What is the purpose of it? Now, man is totally a spiritual being because that spiritualness which we might call God permeates him entirely and not and not only the permeation of the physical body or the mental body but also everything that governs him all his thoughts are also empowered by that spirituality within himself. Why we call it unfoldment is because through millions of years of existence he has gathered around him a lot of dross and it is like a dirty window. So the path of spiritual unfoldment lies in the fact of cleaning the window where pure light could shine through. Good. Now, everyone, consciously or unconsciously, is seeking for happiness. Now, it all depends what we mean by happiness, because if you find happiness, you will surely find misery. For they are the obverse and reverse sides of the same coin. So the search in spiritual unfoldment or realizing the spirit or self-realization is not for happiness. Happiness could be a side product. Where does happiness come from? Does it come from the senses, really? Hmm? You look at a beautiful flower and you feel happy. Hmm? You see an accident on the road and that makes you feel unhappy. Hmm? Now, here is sight. Then, if we come to the other sense of hearing, you listen to a beautiful symphony and you feel elated and you hear disconcordant sounds like a bomb dropping, for example, and you would feel unhappy. So, happiness or unhappiness is not dependent upon the body and the motor organs. It's not dependent on the senses. Happiness is dependent entirely upon the mind. Now, how the mind interpret, interprets the perceptions it receives, there lies the secret. Now, if the mind is well trained through meditation and spiritual practices, now remember the mind is like a lake full of waves, bubbling up and down. 
And as long as these waves keep on being in turbulence and turmoil, so would your receptivity be. So, by changing one's attitude, what we very simply mean is changing the mind, repatterning the mind, as I always say. And through spiritual practices, one brings about a greater calmness within the ripples. Now, if this is not achieved, then it also has great beneficial results that by self-analysis, which is Gnana Yoga, which you might have heard of, through self-analysis, we know the value of the turbulence. We know that all the happinesses or unhappinesses we undergo is because of the, of the turbulence in the mind. Now, when one can look at this turbulence objectively, when one can look at this turbulence objectively, then the turbulence or the ripples in the mind loses its value, loses its sting, and you do not become unnecessarily elated and neither deflated. So this area is beyond happiness and unhappiness. You reach an area where happiness and unhappiness becomes the same. Someone asked me this morning, Guruji, how are you feeling? You were ill. I said, I wasn't ill. I wasn't ill at all. Hmm? Only the body went through some changes because of change of climate and this and that. Hmm? But I could observe the body going through all the nose leaks and <laughs> what have you. Yeah, it's a pity uh, they haven't invented some kind of, um, uh, what is that you put in taps? Yeah. Washer. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. So, when one changes one's attitude, what you are actually doing is objectifying that which you are going through. Hmm? And by objectification, you become the witness hmm, of what is happening. Now, most of you know that there are two hemispheres in the brain. Hmm? The one section governs all thinking and analysis. And that is the section that has to be brought under control. Hmm? Where, if that section of the brain that undergoes all analysis and expresses it through symbols or words, or rather interprets it, interprets any happening or thing hmm? within its means, within its limited means, now, if that limitation is removed, then you can objectify any happening. Hmm? So, what we do is draw from the intuitive faculty, or rather the spiritual faculty in man, which can be expressed through the brain cells. Hmm? So by spiritual practices, we are activating that section of the brain, the right hemisphere, I think it is, whereby you draw forth certain energies which quietens the turbulence in the left hemisphere. Hmm? Now, this cannot be done by the left hemisphere alone. Hmm? Not that the two hemispheres are apart from each other, but 
it is not alive as it should be. Now when the spiritual energies are poured into the analytical side of the brain, the judgmental part, the rationalizing part, then your rationalizations will have or will assume a different meaning altogether because it is filled or to a certain measure filled with that spiritual energy which is within you. Now, this will change the entire character of your thinking. And when the entire character of your thinking is changed, your attitude will change. So, the attitude one has to have for spiritual unfoldment is tackled from so many different angles. Firstly, by enforcing it with spiritual energy. Secondly, by looking at things in the right way. Like I quoted this couplet a million times before, and you must have heard it, two men behind prison bars, one saw mud, the other saw stars. Both in the same circumstances, but the attitude. One saw glory, and the other saw gloom. And this gloom is produced by man himself because he has not found the secret. It's a secret less secret rather, because it is inherent in man. But he has failed to activate that inner force within him, that kingdom of heaven which is within. He has failed to open the gates so that this flood of energy could rush through into his mind stuff and help him change his attitudes in life. For the nature of man is joy, which is beyond happiness and unhappiness, beyond the laws of opposites. But one has to release the joy. There has to occur an explosion within oneself and that explosion comes about by yearning for that joy. For nothing is achieved for nothing. You don't get nothing for nothing and very little for sixpence. (laughs) Right. Now, when we open the doors of that infinite source that is within us, then with the power, the added energy that's given to the analytical mind, our attitudes change. One person can go through the severest misery in life and yet look at it so objectively that he does not feel that misery at all. Hmm? For in every adversity there is an opportunity. Hmm? Anything adverse can be changed. Hmm? I know a friend during business days who had quite a nice job. Hmm? Uh, And He was sacked from the job. Redundancy. That's what the bosses always tell you. Hmm? Good. So he was at loose ends. His wife and children had to make a living. So he thought, let me start something on my own. Hmm? Which he did. With empty bags and bottles. And collecting them and reselling them and things like that. 
from there he graduated into a little shop from the shop he started making it bigger 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 and today he earns so many big buildings in one of our main streets in Cape Town called Whale Street so that little fish struggling in his job became a whale huh? in Whale Street <laughs> now if this very man if this very man became despondent I said I've lost a job now what to do then he would sit at home and say, Oh God, Oh God, Rama, 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 Rama. It was not going to help him. But he personally put his thought forces to action and he did something. Here, yeah. in England, I know a person who started as a laborer. Hmm? and heads a large catering chain hmm? so action 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 so now this is the other angle reinforcing the mind reinforcing the mind with spiritual force which gives you that energy right objectifying the thought be it either of happiness or unhappiness and being untouched by it and then putting it into action now what happens with action is this it solidifies your thought it makes that thought force gets imprinted more deeper and more deeply into the mind and then if it is deep enough, it becomes a reality to you. Hmm? So, it is all a matter of mind. Hmm? And, of course, being all a matter of mind, most times the mind doesn't matter. Hmm? So on the path of unfoldment, after going all through all this, hmm? one could strengthen the mind and use it as a very powerful instrument because a thought is a thing. And if you think deeply enough, strongly enough, powerfully enough, you can bring anything into reality. Because thought as I said, is a thing, is a thing. It exists in your mind for the moment, but you can materialize that thought. But it has to have the spiritual force behind it. Hmm? That is why people pray to find the strength. Hmm? But when they pray, uh, they normally try and bargain. Hmm? They try and bargain. That, Lord, if you do this for me, then I will give that to charity. You do it first, and afterwards I will. Huh? Yeah. Business. What a business. Huh? You see, now by that, one does not change one's attitude. Hmm? To change one's attitude, to repeat again, one has to act. Hmm? One has to act. And if the mind is strengthened in right action, to perform right action, then it will add on greater and greater strength. Now, as far as attitudes and thoughts, attitude is nothing but thought. As far as attitudes and thoughts are concerned, <coughs> there is a wonderful mechanism at work that if you think a right thought, you will attract unto yourself 
thoughts of a similar nature that are floating around in this universe. Because a thought can never be destroyed. It is indestructible. There is nothing in this universe that could ever be destroyed. It could only be transformed hmm? from one thing unto another, but never destroyed. So, these thoughts, once, although causing an imprint in your mind, the essence, by imprint I mean the essence in your mind, the rest of it is sent out, it floats out from you, Hmm? into the atmosphere. Hmm? Now, if you are thinking a hateful thought, a miserable thought, then all those thoughts that are of like nature, that are hateful and miserable, will be attracted to you like iron filings to a magnet, and it will strengthen that particular hateful thought in you, so you become more hateful. Hmm? So if there is a loving thought, you will attract to yourself. In the same manner, the principle is the same. Hmm? So, with a little conscious effort, hmm? if one thinks correctly, rightly, then attitudes will change very, very quickly. And the greatest attitude in life would be this, to find the way home, to find a spiritual, to unfold the spirit so that it could shine in its full glory. And after all, what is the spirit in man? What is that energy in man? It is nothing else but love. God is love. Love is God. So here you have all the energies of the universe and that which is beyond the universe at your disposal. What we have to do in the beginning, with conscious effort, is to cleanse the carburetor in the motor car. Mm -hmm. The tank is full of petrol, inexhaustible supply. But if the carburetor is clean, the jets are clean, the petrol flows through smoothly and the car runs smoothly. And this depends on attitude. So, although the mind being the most cunning animal on earth, it can also be the most helpful mate. Hmm? And it does not mean uh, that you just carry on and auto-suggest to yourself certain repatternings because when you auto suggest hmm, uh, an opposite thought, there is some help on the superficial level. Hmm. When your mind is filled with some ugly scene, then you very consciously try and bring to mind some pleasant scene that you have experienced. But this is on the superficial level, and the change that would occur would only be on the superficial, that little percentage of the conscious level. But if energies are drawn from within, then those energies do not only penetrate the conscious mind, but they also cleanse the various layers of the subconscious mind. That is where all the trouble begins. Mm -hmm.
that is where all the trouble begins because the subconscious mind with its various layers of so-called density hmm, contains all the conditionings that you are going through all the circumstances that you are going through it is all there in seed form and now and then they rise up to the conscious level and rising to the conscious level it has its physiological and physical expression so, by here are two ways again that you try and turn a bad thought into a good thought. Hmm? Auntie Mary said a bad word to me last week and I feel so hurt. But let me think back. Hmm? Last Christmas, how kind she was. She helped me so much. Look at that lovely gift she sent me. She spent weeks and weeks knitting that jersey for me. And with every stitch, she had me in mind. How kind of her. Let me think of her kindness instead of that little word she said in, in a bad mood or a temper. You see? Because everyone has goodness in them. Hmm? We just have to really look hard enough to see that goodness. Hmm? So that is how we turn the negative thought into a positive thought. But this only has a superficial value. Hmm? It is very helpful. But when we treat the subconscious layers of the mind and fill it with that light of the spirit within, then we are unfolding the spirit. And as the spirit unfolds, our whole attitude towards life must change. Inevitably, it changes. Hmm? I have seen meditators, and a lot of them are sitting here, and I find them today totally different people hmm, than what they were when I met them about three years ago. Hmm, because of the spiritual practices, they've recharged their systems with a spiritual force. And with that, and having satsangs and listening to tapes, a different understanding is gained. So, life has to be tackled from various angles, from the thought level, objectifying thought, right thinking, right action, in the waking state of life, very consciously, and very gradually we try to change the things that we can change and we also develop the ability to accept the things we cannot change. Say, now this is the proper change of attitude. Hmm? If a person limbs or has to use crutches He's not going to sit and moan the whole day through that, oh, crutches, scratches, scratches. He'll make good use of it. He should in any case. Hmm? If a person um, becomes blind, that you are always compensated, that is the law of nature. Your hearing becomes more acute. You can hear sounds which normally you would have not been able to hear. Hmm? I know a person, a very plain looking person, her face is all pockmarked and um, if you pass in the street you would 
not really look at the person. Hmm? Yet she's so wonderful. She has an attitude towards life. She has an experiences, a certain joy that over bubbles, her cup runneth over, and to be in her cup runneth over, and to be in her company, and to talk to her is like having a bath, you feel cleansed. Hmm? You see how she has turned from extreme repulsiveness into total attractiveness, and her house is always filled with visitors, because her joviality, her attitude to life, just radiates, radiates a kind of warm love, a spirituality that you just cannot resist. So you see, <coughs> <coughs> Pardon, that was a nice one. <coughs> it's quite pleasant coughing. Yes, it's nice. It's nice. Mm, good. Um, so, that is where attitude counts. And that is how these are a few very simple ways of changing attitudes. Mm? I cough and I say, oh, I'm bloody coughing. Hmm? It's going to make me feel miserable, isn't it? Hmm? But I say, I'm enjoying the cough. <laughs> ah, it makes me feel happy. Hmm? Because when you cough, you know, there's a sensation in the throat and I enjoy it. Yes, nothing wrong with it. Mm, the body is subjected to various things. The body has limitations. And if you stand apart mm, and observe the body while it functions, mm, then nothing harms you or hurts you. Like the Gita would say, not to be elated by good happenings and not to be deflated by that which is not so good. And that brings about equilibrium. <coughs> and that <coughs> equilibrium is that which changes attitude and gives you the fulfillment of life. Now, the fulfillment of life does not depend on pleasures and pains. The fulfillment of life is far beyond pleasures and pains. Hmm? It is far beyond. It is an indescribable joy. Hmm? It is that bliss that permeates you all the time, even while you're waking or sleeping or dreaming. It does not matter, because that very bliss is life itself. Hmm? Do we really live? Hmm? We think if we move around and walk around, do this and that, that we are living. No, we are just existing, living dead. So we have to wake up, wake up to that bliss, to that joy, to our inherent nature, which is blissful, to the real I, not this superficial I to which we attach so much importance. Now, when one has that attitude, then the path to unfoldment also becomes joyous. For in the end you will find that the goal and the path has been but the same. Hmm? 
Joy lies not in attainment itself, but also in attaining. For life is forever striving, and if there was no striving, there would not be life. For it is this very striving that keeps this universe alive, that keeps this universe in motion. And no one can stop it. No divine force can stop it. For even divine forces are subjected to certain laws. What we have to do is just to fall in line with those laws. That's all we have to do. And by awakening that divinity within us, we automatically and very spontaneously go on the path in accordance with the laws that govern this universe. And how far is the universe? How vast is the universe? Hmm? It is as vast as you are. You are the universe. You are the master of the universe. You are the master of your destiny. Hmm? No. This comes from analysis. This comes from looking at things using the mind in its proper way. Hmm? But the mind is not the only way. Hmm? When you feel the mind is just tired and you just can't conquer it, hmm? although it's not too difficult to do, but some people find difficulties in the smallest little thing. Hmm? Hmm? Some people find difficulty in getting up from the chair to go and fetch a cup from a table in the corner. It's difficult, it's too much trouble. Hmm? Yeah. So what do you do then? Hmm? Then you get into the area of devotion, hmm? where you say, not my will, but thy will be done. Hmm? Now this implies a surrender, hmm? a surrender of the little self, to the big self. Hmm? So actually, you are surrendering yourself to yourself. You are surrendering, surrendering your little self, the ego-orientated self, to the real self that is within you. And you would find with sincerity that this works. Hmm? When there is complete surrender of the small self to the big self, what happens is this, that you become totally oblivious of your conditionings. You become totally oblivious of all your weaknesses. Hmm? You become totally oblivious of the ego self. Hmm? And then you tell the ego, you go. Yes. Hmm? And when that merges away into the big self, hmm? and you allow the big self to act through you, through the body and the mind, hmm? which is now in a state of suspension, hmm? and yet capable of acting. It sounds paradoxical, but that works. You can be in a state of suspension and yet act. Hmm? Ask your bank manager about suspense accounts, he'll tell you. <laughs> so, so, that is the other way. Hmm? So therefore, as I said the other day, there's no hope lost for anyone. 
for in the path of unfoldment we have love and hope as the basis of life. For without love and hope there is no life, no life whatsoever. And yet, paradoxically, paradoxically enough, everything is life. There is no death. Huh? There is no death. Hmm? As the great master said, I teach you of life and death. Choose life. Hmm? Meaning that I might tell you about so-called death, but I tell you to choose life because life is eternal. Hmm? And in the eternity of life, there cannot be any death because that which is permanent cannot have anything impermanent. And what impermanence we find is a superimposition. It is an illusion created by man's mind. So, we've got all the tools at our hands. It costs nothing. It costs nothing. To become the master of the universe costs you nothing. There's meditation, spiritual practices, the right thinking, the right action, little effort to change our ways of life. And that's about all. And if that can't be done, just surrender to a mightier will. Hmm? Just surrender. Let my little ego I sacrifice. Hmm? At first with little effort, and then with a little understanding. Huh? And then spontaneity comes, where I, James, John or Jack, Jean, Joan or Jeanette does not exist, only he exists. Hmm? Good. The second part of the question was about smoking, meat-eating, alcohol. Hmm. People on the spiritual path has to have certain observances. I would like to recommend to you uh, a book by Swami Vivekananda called Raj Yoga. Or I have done two tapes on Raj Yoga which you could borrow and listen to. Um, and the first two are Yama and Niyama. Hmm? The observances of life. Now, this has also been printed in article form in Yoga Today. Hmm? Yeah, so you could get a copy of that as well. That will help you. Now, a person on the spiritual path has to have certain observances. Now, there are movements in the world. That will tell you that if you want to be initiated or join our movement, you must not smoke, you must not eat meat, you must not drink, you must not uh, something else which men and women do. I don't know, <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> Good. They tell you they make it conditional upon you. Hmm? Good. In our movement, we don't enforce these things. Because if a person has been eating, say, meat, you know, for hundreds of years, you know, if they're so old, <laughs> whatever, 10, 15, 20 years, 50 years, now it would be very dangerous and any doctor will tell you this, to withdraw from that just immediately. Your system is so used to that. 
So, if as you go on with your meditational practices, and as the system becomes more and more refined, then your need for grosser foods will become less and less and less. <coughs> so here, you don't force yourself into things. Because as the system becomes more refined, you will want more refined foods and drinks and whatever you have. Now, then when you have reached the stage where you have gone beyond it all, then you become a law unto yourself. Then you can do anything you like and you won't have any effect whatsoever. You're beyond it all. Hmm? So it's really simple. Um, what I would advise for those that are contemplating vegetarianism is this, that if you eat meat three times a day, which many people do, bacon and eggs in the morning, um, steak burger for lunch, uh, and at night... Uh, some kind of stew, something like that, I don't know. Fine, is to um, cut it down a bit. Cut it down a bit. Uh, if you eat meat seven times a week, uh, seven times in a week, cut it down to six, later on to five, four. Hmm? Cut it down slowly. Because <coughs> food definitely has an effect upon a person's thinking. Now, food also has the gunas. Now, that is a different subject, and Keith has a whole catalogue of tapes where there are three forces of nature, tamas, rajas, and sattva. Tamas is inertia, the rajas is the activating force, and sattva is the pure force, the light. Now, th these three elements control the entire material universe, even from the subtlest to the grossest. Now, food also contains these three forces. Now, in grosser foods, you'll find Thomas more dominant. Hmm? And in finer foods, you'd find sattva more dominant. Hmm? The purity, the refined aspect of the material universe, you'll find that more dominant. So, the more grosser foods we ingest, hmm? the grosser our bodies could become, and grosser our thinking could become. Yeah. After all, what is the human body? The human body is nothing but food. Hmm? That's all what it is. The human body is nothing but food. The human body is composed of food. All these muscles and blood and bones, etc., have been formed by food. Hmm? So, as we go on in our meditational practices and we become more and more refined, our need for tamasic food, grosser foods, will become less and less. Some people go to extremes that, oh, um, this is tamasic food, so I must not touch it and things like that. Um, they would go to such extremes whereby they would even harm their bodies, and overnight changes are no good. So, see how you feel as you go on, the needs become less. And then you would eat purer foods. Now, if it comes to life, 
there you will find, as some Indian scientists had discovered, he discovered a, a heartbeat in a cabbage. So everything contains life. Some forms of life uh, of are a lower developed stage in the scale of evolution and naturally animals are of a higher stage in evolution than the plant stage. So we sustain life by consuming life. And when our systems become more refined, and we can consume that which is of a lower stage, by all means, that is good. Hmm? And then you, when you reach beyond all this, beyond the laws of opposites, and even beyond that, e that which is beyond life, hmm? you can be in the world and yet not of the world. And when that stage is reached, you have the license to do anything you like, for there will be no attachments, no impressions created on the mind that will perpetuate happinesses and unhappinesses. So in our organization, we leave it entirely to the meditators. Hmm? You have to walk with your own feet. I can only show you the path to unfoldment. Mm -hmm. The choice is yours. Let the choice be good, wholesome. Mm -hmm. Wholesome that leads to a wholeness. Then we have life. Then we enjoy life. Mm -hmm. Then we become one with the Father. Hmm? Isn't that nice? Mm -hmm. Hmm. To become one with divinity. Hmm? Oh, look, Christ ate fish and he drank. He had a good old time, the little boy. <laughs> <laughs> But then remember, he was in full control of all nature. He was. He dined with the Pharisees and in the inns and the innkeepers and etc., etc. But he was not defected. He was still one with his father. How far are we? It's lunchtime. A few minutes left. Okay then. See you later. Good. Enjoy your lunch.